and experiences of choosing a home birth following a cesarean section, which I think is going to be a great follow-up to Amy's presentation a couple hours ago. Hazel's in the final stages of a Master's of Nursing with Honors at the University of Western Sydney, where she has undertaken research on women's experiences of home birth after a previous cesarean. Hazel is also an independent practice midwife in regional New South Wales, Australia, and she coordinates the Central West Better Birth Group, which offers support and advocacy for birthing women in that region. So Hazel, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Hello. Okay, Excellent. hi Thank Hazel. you very much Go for your introduction. Can you... Hello. Can everyone hear me okay? Excellent. Okay, so yep, my name is Hazel and um, I first of all want to shout out to um, my wonderful supervisors for my Masters, which is Professor Hannah Darlin, Professor Virginia Schmeid and Dr Elaine Burns, all from the University of Western Sydney. So let me get started. So the outline of this presentation, we'll talk very, little, uh, very briefly about what is a VBAC, and the aims and objectives of the research that I did. We'll talk about VBAC rates, literature review, methodology results, and then the implications of the research. So the aim of the study that I did was to explore the women's reasons for and experiences of choosing a home birth following a cesarean section. And there was a bit of history to this. Um, which comes from my own personal history. So first of all, I was a midwife and I was a midwife supporting women at home. I was also um, a woman that had a cesarean, um, a home birth transfer cesarean for my first birth and then a VBAC vagina birth after cesarean for my second birth. So I had a very keen interest in this area. So what is a VBAC? You guys know this. It's a vaginal birth that is achieved following a previous cesarean section. Other terms that are often used is NBAC or next or normal birth and particularly for this study is HBAC or home birth after cesarean. The VBAC rates internationally are not particularly great. There was an interesting discussion earlier in Amy's session about the different VBAC rates around the world which I took note of and, and they were very interesting in Europe. We were looking in the, in the 30s and the 40s and higher. Um, in America, Amy told us it was 8.5%. And Australia-wide, um, it was 12.3% at the last um, Australian Mothers Report, Mothers and Babies Report. Now I'm in the state of New South Wales. For those of you that don't know, Australia are made up of states and territories. Um, and we have um, figures put out for our specific state. So for New South Wales, right down in 2011, as you can see on this graph, it's 11.5%. So this is women that have had a vagina birth after cesarean. Um, it doesn't tell you the amount of women that went for a VBAC and had a repeat cesarean. It just tells you the amount of women that went for VBAC and achieved that. So as you can see, there's been a steady decline since the year 2000, which is the first statistics uh, that we've got on this. Obviously, for part of my research, I had to look at the literature review. Um, and I did a, an extensive literature review. I found that generally VBAC rates are low. As, we, as we've just discussed. Um, and yet there is a difference. So when you look in the literature around feedback rates out of hospitals, so birth centres and home births, they are a lot higher, often 75 to 90% um, success rates. In the research when there was um, a study that was done in a, in a hospital or a group of hospitals, they could achieve 50 to 65% of feedback rates in hospitals, but as we know, um, in in reality, these are a lot lower. We know that rupture rates are minimal, so any woman that's gone for a VBAC and anyone that's looking after women having a VBAC, we know that the big issue is all about the, the um, rupture. Um, but rupture rates are low, 0 0.5, 0 0.15 to 0.9 for, um, you know, for most uterine ruptures. If you add uh, hormones and induction, such as syntocinon, prostaglandin, it goes up to 1.4 to 1.9. And if you have only a six month into pregnancy rate, that went up to 2.7. But these are still very low rates. We know that repeat cesareans are risky to both mother and baby, and, and Amy touched on this a bit earlier. But we know for mother, for the mums, there are higher rates of endometritis. 
there's more need for blood transfusions and there's more chances of an oper operated injury. For baby, there's a higher use of higher need for oxygen at birth, higher NICU admissions, and higher number of newborn infections compared to women having a VBAC. We know from the qualitative studies around VBAC that women seem to prefer VBAC. They tend to say that they get, they get a better recovery, they find they have a better bonding with their baby, um, they often choose to have a VBAC because they're avoiding intervention and they want to feel they've got more informed choice. The guidelines for the management around VBAC, they are written by national professional bodies. There's a disparity often between the success and the rupture rates. They approve of interventions and they often necessitate them, such as CTG monitoring. And we could say that maybe they're not women-centered. They certainly don't really give um, a, a chance to negotiate. So the study that I did, I looked at women that had a VBAC at home in the last five years. That was a couple of years ago now, so it would have been in the last seven years. They had to be happy to be interviewed, and these were done by face-to-face -face or telephone interviews and speak English. Um, it was advertised through social media interest groups, and they had a lot of interest. Um, once the interviews were done, uh, they were transcribed, and a software program is called, called NVivo, and I used thematic analysis to, um, to analyze that data. So overall, I had 14 women um, as part of the study. There was one overarching theme, and that came up as it's never happening again. This overarching theme covers the reflection from previous cesarean experience and their motivation for a different experience this time. So on each of these slides, you'll find some quotes. I won't read them out to you, out to you so if you can, you can just have a read. And these are, these are quotes that have come from the women that have been interviewed. There are two arms of this overarching theme, the why it's never happening again, again and how it's never happening again. And why it's never happening again, we will look at these and um, the titles were treated like a piece of meat, traumatised by it for years, but you can smell the fear in the room and re-traumatised by the system. I know these are quite powerful terms, but these, these titles came from the women's own words. So a piece of meat on a cold slab, I'll just let you read that. This is how women describe their civilian experience. They describe feelings of a loss of control, feeling a loss of dignity, feeling like they were just a number in the system, and also feeling quite separated from their body when they were having a cesarean experience. I was traumatized by it for years. So this is how women felt about the cesarean experience and, and their ongoing feelings of this. A lot of women explained how they, were, they felt gutted or they felt that they were a failure. Some women were replaying this surgery over and over in, this head, in their head. There were some women that were identified as post-traumatic stress disorder or postnatal depression. And often this was picked up by a healthcare provider um, in their postnatal period and then they were referred to counselling for it. This particular little picture has come from a larger artwork that was um, done by one of the um, interviewees. Um, and is in her journey and her healing from, um, from her cesarean. You can smell the fear in the room. So some women attempted to be back in the hospital after their first cesarean, and some of the women achieved that. Um, but this, and the smell of fear in the room really explains how women found this experience. They often identified that obstetricians didn't believe in birth, um, and they also felt there was a lot of focus around their scar. And one woman saying, um, where she says it was all about my scar, and she, she goes on to say that she was in, in labour and she was doing great, and then midwives came in and said, so does your scar hurt? And she thought, oh, damn you, I wasn't even worried about that at that point. And then it came up and then she was having to process that in her mind. And the women felt that they were very vulnerable. Um, they were vulnerable to the fears of the professionals, um, and they also, they felt that they didn't understand, they didn't maybe have enough knowledge to be able to stand up for themselves. The hospital at Trauma looks at the women's, um, women once they had had their cesarean and, and whether or not they'd had a VBAC in the hospital afterwards. So this particular pregnancy that they had a home birth for, they didn't automatically decide they were going to have a home birth. They did approach the hospital first of all. But this time they approached the hospital with a lot more knowledge. 
they wanted to avoid the interventions that obviously didn't work for them last time. Um, and they found that really the system was very inflexible. They were often told no, even if the woman is saying in this, in this um, example that she's going to put it in her birth plan, the woman, the hospitals were saying, well, you can't. They found the system was inflexible. They also found that they were feeling that they were being bullied again, all over again. And the women were worried that if they continued with this pregnancy and, and birthing in the hospital, that they just wouldn't be able to say no. So then that is the why they don't want that to, to happen again. Now it's um, how it's never happening again. So the women in the study, they really got informed and they started looking at risk in perspective. They were able to access lots and lots of information. And some of that might be the, the research and um, medical information. Um, and some of it was women's experiences and other women's stories. And they really buy it, they really balance that up, the scientific information with the storytelling. They realised that the system was not going to support their VBAC in the way that they wanted to have a VBAC. They weighed it all up and decided that home birth after a home birth um, after cesarean was a safe option for them. Um, and they found that this knowledge became their armour and they became strong with that information. So avoiding judgment through selective telling, once the woman had decided to have um, a home birth after cesarean, this was a, a, a challenge to tell people. Um, and as we know, people always like to share their opinions with pregnant women once you get that bump. And they really didn't want to be around that negativity. So some women um, didn't tell anyone. Some women only told those that were going to be involved um, in the birth. And some only told them when they did the birth announcement by text message. Baby born at home, which was planned. Preparing for birth was um, uh, in different ways. So they may have trained themselves up physically. Um, they may prepare themselves mentally for it. I'll be setting up the home so that it's ready for a home birth. They de definitely dealt with the what ifs. And so they may have got some ambulance cover just in case. They would tell me in the interview how far they were from the hospital how long in, in, in kilometres or in time it would take to get there, what their backup plans were going to be. So there was a lot of preparation once that decision had been made. Gathering support was a vital part in this preparation for, for an HBAC. And this was in, a, in three different areas. So the first person, um, if they had one, was their partner. And uh, that was really getting their partner on board to be their support. The second person was a hired help, so that could be a doula. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about midwives in a minute, but this was particularly doulas. Um, and there were some extremely positive things to say about doulas. Sometimes it was the doula that maybe suggested to them about a home birth. Um, and then thirdly, there was support groups. And this was really quite um, an interesting part of it. These support groups, because Australia were, were a very big country and have very big distances, they weren't always face-to-face. -face. They were often online. They might have been using the social networking sites that we're so familiar with. Um, and some of them were face-to-face -face as well. But this support from the women, as Felicity mentioned in the previous session, um, women love sharing stories. So having that contact with other women that had been through, the, been through a VBAC or been through an HBAC um, was really important for these women. All about safety, but I came first. So this is where the women talked about their relationship with a private midwife. The majority of women did hire private midwives. And they talked about this um, relationship as the midwives gave support and friendship. They found that their, their, their care that the midwives gave them was tailor-made. There were often long appointments, one or two hours sitting at home. And often these appointments were going through in detail what a, woman, what a woman had gone through last time, what a woman's experiences were at the caesarean, so that the midwives were aware what her triggers were and what her story was. Obviously, there was continuity of care. And this was obviously from when they booked their midwife for the labour and birth and for postnatally as well. They also described their time with the midwife um, during the labour and birth and, and described it as 
she would sit back and observe. So the midwife wasn't always right in there um, you know, doing all the physical care for the woman. It was more an observation and more a support when the woman needed it most. So then we looked at the impact of HBAC. So you had your two arms of the overarching theme and then there was the impact. I felt like Superwoman. Now this was, and this is where I'm going to play you a sound, bite, a sound bite now. This is when I asked the women a question, how did you feel after your VBAC at home? And when I was listening and transcribing this in these interviews, I just thought I'm never going to get this out to out to my audiences on just writing out all this, you know, what the women are saying because, you know, I would listen to these interviews. There would be a lot of emotion around them talking about their previous experiences, and and then when I would ask them this this question, you could just hear them, oh, you could hear them inflate with their pride. So I thought I would make that into a soundbite. So I'm just going to play that now, and I hope you guys can all hear this. How did you feel after having your VBAC at home? Oh, euphoric. Absolutely euphoric. It was, it was amazing. It, really... it was just overwhelming. It was just, it was just the most magical experience. Absolutely awesome. It was everything that I wanted it to be. Ecstatic. Mm -hmm. um, powerful. I don't think I came back down to earth for about two weeks. Awesome. <laughs> that was the most amazing experience. Oh, amazing. Amazing. No drugs, just... Uh, wonderful. It empowered. I not do anything. Yeah, it, was, it just felt very normal, I yeah. suppose. That's kind of the best way I could describe it. Yeah, um, it was great and it was very positive and it was relaxed and um, yeah, it was uh, it was a really healing experience which I suppose is what most people would have felt really normal and, and good, yeah. Just blown away, it was mind blowing, best experience of my life and it wasn't because it was a VBAC, it was because it was a it was just giving birth. I felt like I needed to run around with a big fat I told you so sign. To my GP, you know, to my to everybody. Um, I felt like I felt like finally I could relate to a lot of the mothers I know who have given birth vaginally. Um, and actually I felt I had one up on them because they stood <laughs> in, in hospital under you know what I mean? I, I felt like I had one up on them. Oh, I felt like a superwoman. It was wonderful. It was wonderful. Uh, initially, fantastic. This is the best thing that's ever happened and I want everyone in the whole world to know how fantastic this is. And oh, like the high was just so high. It stayed as one of the best moments of my life still. Um, and that was, you know, five, four and a half years ago. It, you, I would not ever forget, I don't think, how amazed I was to have, to have actually done it. You feel so... Um, happy and um, you know complete and you know I, I I got to enter into this you know not not club but I feel like you know this is what I was meant to do as a woman not just to have the baby at the end of it but actually to give birth to my own child Okay, um, so that is really the women's experiences on, on how they felt. Um, it was, it, having this VBAC, it, it was really, it, it seems to have been a stepping stone for women. Um, and they went on, um, hang on, this is the next slide. Um, they were able to really discuss the differences because obviously these women had had um, a hospital experience and maybe one or more hospital experiences. They experienced many different uh, models of care, such as private obstetrician for some of these women, and some women had group practice, some of them had standard and safe care where they would see a different midwife each time. And then they had private midwifery care. So, you know, one theme that we found was that there was just no comparison. Um, as you can see in, in that photo there, used with, used with permission, there was, it, it was a multi-generational event. 
Um, and the woman could really choose who was going to be there and, and who weren't going to be there. So in, um, in Australia in particular, there is a lot of politics around home birth um, and insurance, and that would be a whole other presentation to go through that now. But there was, because of the changes that seem to be happening all the time, we, I asked the women during their interview, what would you do if, if home birth um, after cesarean was no longer an option? And this was a really interesting response that we got from the women. Um, there was, you know, one woman who, who would basically say, no, I, I, you know, I definitely wouldn't, I wouldn't do a free birth. And then while she was talking about it, she was convincing herself of doing a, a free birth by the end of it. And it was a very difficult situation to put these, um, put these women into. And the comment, the second comment, um, what I haven't discussed is that we did a focus group for midwives as well. Um, and the same question was asked for these private midwives, what would you do if you could no longer attend um, a home birth uh, when you're having an edge back? And there was a discussion on whether the midwife would go unregistered, whether she would work under the radar. And one midwife here very honestly um, said that she doesn't feel that she would be able to do that. Um, and I thought that was a really interesting, interesting point to it. So really in, in summarising this slide, the women really, the wise women that said they wouldn't free birth, they said they would go back to the hospital but it would be on their terms. Um, and others really thought they would probably would free birth. So free birth means having a, um, a home birth without any um, qualified professional such as a midwife present. Um, where, I, where I didn't discuss with I felt like superwoman, um, just going back to that one, a lot of women after their HBAC, it really seems to catapult them into the birthing world. Um, some of the women trained um, and became qualified as doulas to be able to share that information. Others just shared it amongst their friends. And so if somebody, one of their friends was discussing what kind of birth they would want to have, then these women felt they really could, um, they could share, share their knowledge and share their passion for birth. So the main points we came from, from the study in, in the discussion is that impact of birth trauma. Um, that, you know, we know that it can stay with women for, for years. And I believe that, you know, some women, they probably bury that um, and take that with them to, to their elective caesarean rather than trying for, for a VBAC. But this particular group of women were interesting because they, you know, they bucked the trend. They decided to go for a VBAC and then to do that at home. The disrespect and abuse of women in maternity care, and we know from the Lancet series that was published last year that this is still very true. Um, and where it comes into relation with women in this study um, is the threats that the obstetricians or the other healthcare providers gave the women if they went on to have their home birth. Um, they were given um, the dead baby cards and that you wouldn't be able to get to hospital in time if there was a problem. There was also, from their original their cesarean experience, was their um, lack of informed consent. They often experienced the, um, the cascade of interventions that ended up with their cesarean, and they felt that they weren't given the full information about that. Inflexible guidelines is where the, you know, where the women, they actually did approach the hospitals first in the majority of cases. They went to the hospital and they said, you know, I want to have a VBAC, but I don't want to have continuous monitoring. I don't want to have a cannula in situ for the whole of my whole of my labour. I don't want to be put on a time and I want to be able to eat and drink when I can. And those guidelines were seen to be so rigid from the hospital staff, or maybe the hospital staff were too fearful to change their their actions, that the women really felt they had nowhere else to go um, than find a private midwife and do that at home. But when we look at the research around home birth after cesarean, the rupture rates are no higher. They are comparable to hospitals, and we know that the VBAC rates, are, we know the success rates are higher. So what is it that we're doing at home, or you know, is the fact that women not being um, continuously monitored or not having to stick to inflexible guidelines do so much better? So really, I guess we, we can take from that as practitioners in hospitals, is, you know, can we have some flexibility? What does that mean is myself as a practitioner, am I going to get into trouble for that? 
Um, or can we actually look at uh, putting women's wishes first? The importance of women's support groups really came out. Um, and I think from our, you know, our standard hospital point of view, you know, we put women in, the, in a, in, we lump them together for an antenatal class uh, where it is very didactic. We, we do the talking and the women do the listening um, a large majority of the time. But maybe if we could actually put women together uh, where they can share their stories and not with just women that are planning that pregnancy so they just breed their fear together, but actually with other women that have already been through it and to share those stories. Um, because that seems to be that kind of sharing and um, identifying of stories seems to, to have a, a great impact. And then lastly, what came out from this, from this study was the role and the support from the privately practicing midwife. So the midwife that isn't being employed by the hospital system has guidelines, but they may not be as rigid as the ones in the hospital, and they very much can be women-centered. Um, and how vital that, that is to walking alongside the woman um, not telling her what she can and she can't do. It is, you know, what do you want to do and how do you feel about that? And that certainly came through in the um, in, in this study. The implications for the study, I know it's a small study, um, but it it has um, it has highlighted some some interesting points. Um, we need to be able to identify the factors that could improve VBAC rates. Um, and is that, you know, is that maybe being not quite so rigid with the guidelines, for example? We need to improve our services to support women rather than saying, no, you cannot do this, and no, you, you know, you will be doing this and you will be doing that. Actually saying, well, what is it, what is it that's important to you? And, improve, and with that, improving attitudes towards women, making, making care in the hospital more flexible. And continuity of care, we know from the death of midwifery um, research that is out there about the benefits of continuity of care. And this, this small study um, helps support that. I seem to whiz through that quite quickly, which gives us plenty of time to um, answer some of the questions that are on the side here. Sam, have you picked up on any questions? Um, well, if anybody wants to raise their hand and ask a question, this is a great time to do it. It seems like a lot of what's been going on in the chat um, is just talking about experiences that so many of us have had with women being told the horror stories by other women, by family members, by providers about the uterine rupture and the baby that's going to die and um, ultimately how selfish a woman is for wanting to choose a VBAC. Um, and, you know, in light of what you've told us, Hazel, that just seems so unfair and so crazy. But is that something you felt like you encountered a lot with the women that you talked to, that they had really been um, almost scared into either having a repeat C-section or having an HBAC because Providers were just so negative or so full of fear. Well, that's interesting. These were this particular group of women um, were far from from scared. In fact, they seemed very frustrated. Um, this room, the a lot of these women were really able to access the information that might have been even more up to date than the professionals that were telling them the statistics. When I was interviewing them, and I, you know, not long done my literature review. A lot of these women were able to throw back the statistics and the studies that I've not long read. So this particular group of women, they were very highly educated. Um, many of them had university degrees, and they were, on a whole, you know, white, middle class, well-educated women. So instead of being scared, I think they were just frustrated. They, they were annoyed. They, they felt that they were being bamboozled into something that they didn't really want to do, so they had to find something else. And for that, that initial step was looking elsewhere and then finding out about home birth and finding out about private midwives. I'm trying to help women achieve that goal.
Yeah, I think that's a really great answer. And we have a really nice comment here from Kat Humphreys, too, that our language plays a big role in women's decision making and also in how uh, we kind of encourage each other to think about this subject. And if we're in an environment where we're constantly surrounded with the language of fear, that's what we're going to, in turn, give to the women we take care of. Let's see, we have some more people typing yeah. questions here. Yeah, that, that's right, Sam. That reminds me of one of the one of the interviews that I did, and the woman who was going for her uh, a VBAC after two cesareans, and she had been going through different models of care during the pregnancy to try and find an obstetrician or to try and find a, a hospital that would accept her, and she just got a bout of no's continuously. She rang up, um, I think she said to me, she rang up five different private midwives, and every single one of them said yes, and every single one of them believed in her. And she said that was the turning point for her to get to turn from one one situation where she was just getting a whole load of no's and negativity to one where there was somebody going, I am I understand why you want to do that and, and, and I'm willing to help you do that. rather than being told what you should and what you shouldn't do. of comments and questions that just came up here uh, the answer for us hazel is the, isn't the home birth option pretty much gone for VBAC in australia well things um seem to be on shifting sands a lot in in here in australia um, at this current time we are we do have guidelines for the national midwifery consultation referral guidelines um, and if the woman chooses to have um, a VBAC at home, you would have a discussion with them. They would probably get a, a second opinion um, from a doctor. And then you could set up a record of understanding with the woman to write down the information that she's been given, the information that you've told her, and then what her ultimate decision is. So it is still um, the woman's choice. And, and a private midwife can, at this point, support her, but something you don't quite need in the future. That's good to hear. That's also a, a question here in the United States. There are certain states where uh, private home birth midwives cannot attend VBACs at home legally, and it creates a lot of problems for women and for midwives. Uh, we have yes, a comment I'm from sure Kat Humphreys. Oh, yep. Go ahead, Hazel. So I'm, I'm saying that probably um, to do with, I'm not sure for the US, but, I, but I'm guessing that might be to do with the insurance. And the insurance saying that you can, that you can't, and that could be an issue for um, home birth midwives in the future uh, in Australia. At the moment, we have an exemption for um, to have for our public uh, professional indemnity insurance for the labour and birth part. So that means we don't have any insurance for that part. But if that did come in, then you know there there is thought that there could be stipulations on that, and where would VBAC sit in that? So you know this is something that we will need to watch. 
Insurance definitely plays a big role in this decision-making process, unfortunately. We have a bunch of comments on the side here about, um, about birth trauma and obstetricians and midwives really coming to grips with the importance of birth trauma um, in counseling women about future births and just taking into account the emotional experience of childbirth more generally. Here's another question. We have, do you hear much of the scar tissue will keep you from having a VBAC argument? No, not really. Um, <laughs> if, you have, if the woman has had um, a lower segment uterine, um, uh, lower segment cesarean, um, then you know, it, I guess the woman would really need to explore what happened. And during that time, and, and there's a good there's a good fight for for women to be able to access their own notes and to be able to read what happened in the operation report. Were there any complications with the cesarean? Was there any reasons why maybe a VBAC isn't the safe safest option um, for the woman? So that would I think come into the to the woman exploring and also on the woman being told the correct information. Um, but on the whole, um, there's some research that shows. Um, um, a slight increase in uterine rupture rates if the pregnancy is very close um, together. Um, but usually, if you go once you get past the 18 month mark, then that is um, still less than one percent. Um, and yeah, I mean, uh, other than other than that, if you've got a classical cesarean, that still doesn't say that you can't. But obviously, the, the rupture rate, rates are much higher. Um, Oh yeah, and I see there to support the ultrasound scar thickness. There's been a, a couple of studies looking at um, ultrasounds and, and scar thickness, um, and you know, using lots of different um, mathematical stuff that they use with their fancy ultrasounds. Um, there hasn't been a, 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 a big move towards that. Um, on but I guess because at the end of the day, you don't know what your uterus is going to do in labour. Not all ruptures happen when you're in labour. And not all ruptures happen to women who have had a previous exam, and we know that. Um, but at the end of the day, you don't really know what it's going to do, and the amount of hormones that you've got thrown through, as we heard from Sarah Buckley, they have very protective factors um, on the woman in general. So, you know, it is hard to to come up with a measurement, as much as um, we also found out that pelvic um, x-rays don't really much use either. Well, thank you so much for those insights, Hazel. It looks like we're about wrapped up with questions, so everyone will have a few minutes to take a break. Um, yeah, and that's it. Thank you so much, everybody, for listening. Having me here today. And thank you, Sam, and thank you, Hazel. That was wonderful. Um, we're going to, you, yes, we do have about 15 minutes before the start of the next session. Um, so take some time. We're now heading into the fifth presentation. I would like you to take some time to remember to fill in the survey. And there are a couple of slides here at the end, so we need to remember to turn off that. Uh, we'll